I believe that your life is never the same as that nanosecond before you hear the word you have cancer. Hi, this is Patrick. And this is Laura. And you're listening to This Is Cancer. Brought to you by Seitman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. National leaders in cancer. Today's episode is incredibly important for anyone out there who has not heard the new guidelines about colon cancer. Right, Patrick? Well, they've lowered the age recently for screening, haven't they? Yes. It's, it used to be 50, and now it's 45. And the reason this is so incredibly important is because we are seeing an increasing number of young people being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And so today we're joined by our two guests, Terry, who is a cancer survivor, we can say, right? And Dr. Wang of Seitman Cancer Center. Thank you both for coming today. Thank you for having us. Dr. Wayne, can you give us your exact title at Seitman Cancer Center? Sure. Well, I'm a gastroenterologist at Washington University and Barnes-Jewish Hospital, and I'm in the Department of Medicine, Professor of Medicine. And Terry, how do you introduce yourself when you tell people, because you're an advocate, you're a survivor, you're... Uh, I'm just a badass, which (laughs) people think that I mean that like I'm a badass, but it's not. It's like short for ambassador. (laughs) <laughs> so I like to just be the ambassador for, for colorectal cancer, and then they can giggle, and they'll never forget me because I'm a it. badass. You're the ambassador. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Terry, I think we're going to have to start with you because your story is quite inspiring, amazing. Um, Keep going. <laughs> I mean, it, first Thank of all, we, there's so many layers to this, but you were sort of blindsided with colorectal cancer in your late 40s when you were training for one of the biggest races of your life. So take us back to what was going on in your life and what happened when you received a diagnosis. So it was age 48, and um, I had been training for an Ironman competition, which is swim, bike, run, kind of what they say, one of the hardest one-day endurance races um, ever. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed my training had been off for a couple months, and I was having some bleeding when I went to the bathroom. I would have, you know, an injury that wouldn't heal very quickly. Just general malaise, some things. But I kind of, even though I was a nurse by training and education for a number of years, I was, the the bleeding I knew wasn't right, but I was kind of embarrassed. And I thought maybe it was hemorrhoids and different things. Mm -hmm. But after I had finished the Ironman, I knew I needed to go get checked out. And so a friend of mine's husband was a gastroenterologist. And the minute I told him my symptoms, fortunately for me, he said, we need to do a colonoscopy. So I went in two weeks after finishing this big race, um, woke up from the colonoscopy. He said there was a huge tumor. And the next thing I knew, I was in a CT scanner. And then six hours later, I was getting a phone call that it had advanced to my liver and it was stage four. So really in the blink of an eye, my life was turned upside down. I can't even fathom the fact that for people that don't know what an Ironman is, it's a 2.4 mile swim, 100 and how many miles of bike? 112. 112 mile bike, and then a 20.26.2 mile marathon. Correct. In one day. Correct. When you were diagnosed, were the doctors like, how did you do this with stage four? I mean, that alone, I mean, obviously getting that diagnosis was horrifying, but you were living with that while doing an Iron Man. That's crazy. Yeah. So um, they were shocked. I, they hadn't really seen a lot of circumstances like me. And I used to kind of laugh at the time, like Lance Armstrong was probably the the most uh, well-known endurance athlete out there. So I used to claim I was a lot like Lance until Lance got in trouble. <laughs> right. I, I right. wouldn't use that. You're like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yes, they were shocked. Were, were you planning on continuing do- down this Ironman path after you did that? Because didn't you do really well in that Ironman? So I was. I, in 2008, I had come in fourth in my age group um, at a race, to, and the third place qualified for Kona. So my goal, that what I was trained for in 2009, was to qualify for the world championship in Kona, Hawaii. And, I, of course, I didn't qualify, but I was actually only 10 minutes slower than the year before, even though my body was compensating and had all this going on in it. So um, I didn't give up that dream of going to Kona to the World Championship. And 
what ended up happening was I sent my story into Iron Man, and in 2011, I was chosen as one of the uh, world inspirational athletes to go to Kona and tell my story, and I was actually able to participate and complete the race um, while on maintenance chemo at the time. But it was awesome because I got to share my story and spread a lot of awareness of um, colon cancer, colorectal cancer, and you know, hopefully saved a lot of lives, which is our, our goal, one of the reasons why Dr. Wang and I are here today to share, share our experience, strength, and hope. Well, we appreciate it. Um, would you like to know what I did when I was on chemo? Yes. I watched Netflix. <laughs> That's what I did. I don't think I was dishing out a lot of hope those days. but uh, It was a pandemic, yeah. Patrick. There was not much else to do. Okay, so Dr. Wang, this was 15 years ago, and yearly we're seeing advancements in cancer treatment, right? So I would assume, Terry, your life expectancy when you were diagnosed was what, probably like five years? Less than 6% chance of surviving five years. Wow. So we're going to have to get to that hope part for you here in a second. But Dr. Wang, what, what, what does that diagnosis look like 15 years ago? And how can you explain the ability for her to still be here? Yeah, well, Terry is really someone who has beat the odds. And, you know, 15 years ago, getting stage four colon cancer would really be a death sentence and uh, still is for, for many people. But the great news is that there are a lot of advances that have happened in the last few decades, um, which have improved life expectancy. For example, there's new chemotherapy treatments. And um, in the past, we used to give everyone the same chemotherapy treatment. But now what we're doing is we're actually taking the tumors from individual patients, and then we're checking for DNA mutations, specific mutations that might be happening in that individual's tumor, and then we can customize the chemotherapy treatment to attack the specific mutations that that cancer in that person uh, has. So that has really advanced our ability to treat cancers, you know, more specifically and more targeted. And um, not only are people living longer, but the treatment has fewer side effects as well. So Terry, if you had a 6% chance and you had stage four colorectal cancer and it had metastasized your liver, what do the doctors credit for your ability to survive it? Well, first of all, I say to myself, well, somebody has to be in the 6%, right? Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't it be me? So I think a lot of it is kind of a mindset type mm -hmm. thing. And then I have to credit uh, Siteman Cancer Center for saving my life. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. I am extremely indebted to them for saving my life, honestly. So... You know, I don't, I just, I'm here. I, I don't question why. I don't, you know, I just am so, so grateful. But I listened to your TED Talk, your St. Louis TED Talk that you gave a while ago, and you talked about getting that diagnosis and how it just shocked you. And then you decided you went to church with your family. Mm -hmm. What did you, what was the story that you heard at church that day that kind of gave you some hope and inspired you that you needed to build a team around you? Sure. So the story was a, it's actually a documentary called um, Running on the Sun. And it's about a woman that decided to go run this ultra marathon. And she didn't have anybody there to support her. She actually was in her 30s and coming over from England. And there was a gentleman that was in the military. And he was decided he was going to do the race too. But he had everybody in his unit or troop mm -hmm. that said they would train and support him. I'm very much minimizing this entire mm -hmm. big story. So the day of the race comes, and the woman had found Maria de Jesus was her name. One gentleman that said he would be her crew, which was actually to drive a sag wagon, her nutrition, her PT, her massage. I mean, everything that you can imagine to take to run this 135 mile ultra marathon from the desert to the top of a mountain. And the race day comes, they all take off, and the, the soldier gets to like mile 56 and he's out. He has to have IV fluids and that automatically disqualifies you. And the, the other soldiers in his unit hear about this woman that now is like at mile 87 and they, they leave and go up and help support her because now their athlete is, is out. And they literally show a clip of her being carried out of this like van and lifted up by these soldiers and stood up, and then they form a half circle around her, 
she literally can't even wear running shoes at this point. She has Tevas on. And um, her feet are so blistered. Her feet are so blistered, no toenails, nothing left. And they, they form this half circle around her, and some way, somehow, she crosses the finish line. And when she crosses that finish line, she turns around and looks at this group of, of individuals and says, I couldn't have done it without you. And right then, I thought to myself, this cancer is way bigger than me, and I've got to form my circle of people that are going to support me. And so we called it my army, and that was very instrumental in helping me uh, get to the finish line. I think that's what I got out of listening to your TED Talk the most, and continuous conversations, Dr. Wang, that we have had with um, other patients and other doctors of the importance of hope when you get a diagnosis and to not, and that they will see the difference in patients that are, are hopeful and positive and those that are letting it, the fear and the unknown overwhelm them. Can you speak to that a little bit and what you see in patients when you give in, you surrender, like Larissa said in a different episode, to what the diagnosis is, but also stay full of hope? Yeah, it's definitely a, a difficult situation when you give someone the diagnosis of cancer for the first time. You know, I think that it's important not to focus on the statistics Mm because you'll go online and you'll see what the survival rates are for each stage of cancer. Mm -hmm. And like Terry said, with stage four, the survival rate was only 6% at her time. But um, every patient is different and everyone is going to be different in how they uh, react to the treatments, how they react to surgery. And it is such a critical point to uh, have that supportive army around you of family and friends. Um, It can definitely make a huge difference because as anyone knows who's gone through treatment, you know, you're going to have really bad days where you just don't feel well. And to know that um, someone's going to be there to uh, help you out and to have your back and um, it can really make a big difference in your uh, overall outcome. And I think to add to the hope part, In 2009, immunotherapy was not, maybe the medical field was talking about it, but it's that hope of, okay, if I can hang in there one more year, what will they come up with? And where the treatment was in 2009 to where it is today, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, we we had a similar situation with with my dad where we, we had all these, we would call them like Hail Mary plays in our playbook where... Like, as bad as his situation was, there was still the chance of this clinical trial, and he he almost hung in there for it. My dad would have been, like, the seventh person to to get this Mm -hmm. treatment that was essentially customized, targeted, like, immunotherapy, and it was incredibly promising. So I think it's kind of a trend across the board with all kinds of cancers where— the technology and the drugs and the treatments are just the research. The research are just exponentially advancing. So, to your point, yeah, it's there's always hope. I mean, if you can hang in there for one more year, something that was a clinical trial could become standard mm-hmm. of care. Right, um, and you had and you had goals too. You set goals of things that you wanted to accomplish because you talk a big about the bucket list that you had. And mm-hmm. how did that propel you? Because weren't it to see your kiddos get married? Yes. And yeah. did you get to see them get married? Uh, my son. <laughs> <laughs> you said that was my personal hope. For my exactly. <laughs> so when I sent this little note off to Iron Man to see if they would choose me to be one of the insp- I came up with this bucket list. And one was to live long enough to celebrate 25 years of marriage. And I think, gosh, I think I'm going to be like at 38 years coming up, which is Congratulations. And then uh, <laughs> to see both my kids get married. My daughter is now married, and hopefully my son will be And then um, soon. And then it was to compete in the, in the World Championship Ironman. So, yeah, there's always goals. Goals are big. Were you going to say something? Yeah, that's well, you know, that's, you know, that's absolutely true what you were saying about new advances happening all the time. I mean, there's so much research going on at Seidman Cancer Center as well as other cancer centers across the country and the world. And you never know when the next breakthrough is going to happen, like Terry said. And so if you can just hang on until that next breakthrough, you can, uh, you know, you, you may be able to hang on long enough to, to find, you know, to get that cure. And I'll give my own personal experience. My father-in-law actually was diagnosed with a metastatic gastrointestinal stromal tumor, which is a rare cancer, about 25 years ago. And it was all over his abdomen. It had spread. 
and he had to get surgery to remove uh, the tumor, and then it would just come back two months later. So for a while, he was getting surgery like almost every three months to get rid of that tumor. Maintenance surgery. Right, exactly. And then, you know, right at that point, he found out about a clinical trial after he had gone through about five surgeries, and he ended up being one of the first patients to be in this new clinical trial for this new drug that was targeting the exact mutation that his tumor has. And um, it eventually ended up being a great success, and he's alive now, wow. 25 wow. years later. How about that? And that drug is now standard of care for patients with his tumor, but he was one of the first few people on that clinical trial. Yeah. Those clinical trials are yeah. so amazing and so... Um, Life saving, and not everyone that participates in the clinical trial, unfortunately, will be able to receive the benefits. But they can be part of the future of the benefits of that clinical trial, and that's what Dr. Keller, when he came on our podcast, was talking about. Like your dad was in several of them, mm-hmm. and you went and did a clinical trial, mm-hmm. and those—that's all the information that helps put the pieces together for the final a, a new cure or a new treatment or a new um, a way of advancing forward. I mean, the bottom line is, like speaking from experience you should be like beating down the door to get into clinical trials if you can. If it's if you've tried the standard of care and right. it's it's not giving you the results that you want because it gives you an edge that I just feel like is so important when you're when you're at that point. Getting a cancer diagnosis can really flip your world upside down. Yeah, I know from talking with you, Patrick, and my sister and other family members that it's just so taxing on you mentally. Absolutely, and I think that's why it's so great that Sightman Cancer Center offers psychological services free of charge to their patients and anybody in their family or their caregivers that might be going through just a tough time when you're in this cancer battle. So even if your care isn't provided by Sightman, you can still go to their website and get great information on the emotional concerns associated with cancer like anxiety disorder, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder. For more information on that, click the link in our episode description. Dr. Wang, I want to ask you here in a second about the increase we're seeing in younger people getting um, getting diagnosed. But first, Terry, I want to know, for those people that, are get, that either have a new diagnosis, a tough diagnosis that you had, how do you, what do you have to say for yourself for being able to do all of that while training for this Ironman? How did you go through all those treatments? You had stage four colorectal cancer and you were still physically moving forward to that goal. How did you do that? And what did you have to go through as far as treatments? So when I was first diagnosed, I went through short course of radiation, and then the standard of care at that time was 12 rounds of full fox plus Avastin, that's the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I became a surgical candidate. So then I had surgery, a colon and liver resection. Because they shrunk the tumors down enough to be able to do the surgery with that chemo. The radiation combined with the chemotherapy Mm -hmm. then made me a surgical candidate where the tumors were small enough that they could be resected. And then I finished up seven more rounds, and then I was placed on maintenance chemotherapy, which I stayed on for about nine years. And in there, I had- And were those pills or those injections? Pills and IV, Mm -hmm. so both. And and I had two reoccurrences, uh, one back- Two in my liver, and then bilat, and then it moved to my lungs. Bilateral lung resections I had, and for whatever reason, right now I am no evidence of disease, and I haven't been on treatment or had a procedure done in five years. So I've kind of wow. been officially released because of that sense. five year mark too. Yes, that's, that's key, yeah. right? The five years. Yeah. And how did you go through all of that, and still, especially in that two year mark from two thousand and nine to two thousand eleven? That's that was the time You're between good. when you were diagnosed and when you did that race in Kona, correct? You know, yeah. So I don't, I don't really know if I thought about how am I going to do this. I just had set these goals and wanted to continue my life the way I lived it before. And sport and triathlon was such a big part of that. But the one thing I think that did change was that um, when I was diagnosed, I was 48. I had two older sisters that were in their early 60s. And they had never had colonoscopies. So right after I had mine, they both went. My one sister had precancerous polyps, and my other sister was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer. So um, I saved my sister's life yes. right away. And so I thought, okay. Both of them. Bo- both of them in the long run, yes. But um, so doing things, endurance sports and all that, instead of doing it because I loved to do it, I did it with a purpose, and that 
also gave me hope. So it's like, you know, spreading awareness. And then eventually I would raise money for research around all that. So I, there's a word, a mm-hmm. little mantra I like to say, you know, like put purpose to your pain, right? Mm-hmm. Know your why. If you know your why and you have purpose to your pain, that, that can be a game changer. I'm curious if you were able to handle the setbacks of reoccurrence and uh, metastasizing and, and having to get resections from your lungs, both lungs, bilaterally. How how were you able to overcome those hurdles? I think that that's a really important question because we we talk about the treatment of chemotherapy or radiation or surgery um, those types of things, but we don't talk about how can we take care of an individual and their mindset and where they are and emotionally. And that is the one thing cancer, Sightman Cancer Center does have a whole another patient support system in there. And I did go for counseling. I used their counseling services and it was a tremendous help. And they offer that for the family members and close friends also. So that wasn't those dark holes, and there are dark holes in dark days, you know, those are things that you, you, you have to ask for help or, or, or your family members push you to go get help, but it's not something you can climb out of there alone. You think of that, you know, you have these images in your mind whenever one's diagnosed with cancer, and you feel like their world's going to stop. But there's, people are living every day, every week, every month, every year with cancer, and they're living full lives. Dr. Wayne, can you talk about, like, that? It, cancer does not mean once you get diagnosed that your life is going to stop and you're going to be sitting in bed for months going through that. Yeah, definitely, and especially with early-stage cancer, it's curable. You know, with uh, colorectal cancer, if the tumor is found uh, while it's still just in the colon and before it's spread to other parts of the body, if you're at stage 1 or stage 2, it can be removed with surgery, that little section of your colon, and then you can be cured and not have to do any further treatment and not have to worry about it. You know, if the cancer is stage three or four, oftentimes you will need to do chemotherapy. But, you know, typically the chemotherapy is just a, a short-term process, and then afterwards um, you should be able to get back to a normal life and then have regular checkups with uh, follow-up scans and follow-up colonoscopies and then go from there. And isn't colorectal cancer one of the most, co- I mean, what are the big cancers? It's lung, breast, colorectal. Are those the big three that we, prostate, that we see diagnosed the most? Yeah, so col- colorectal cancer in the U.S. is the third most common cancer in the U.S., but it's actually the second most cause of cancer death. So it's the wow. second deadliest cancer in the U.S. So it's very common. And a lot of people don't really talk about it like they do with breast and prostate cancer. But that's why it's so important that we're here today to really spread awareness about um, how common colorectal cancer is, but also how preventable it is as well. I just want to add, too, by 2030, it's estimated that it will be the number one cancer killer between ages 25 and 50. That's crazy. By 2030. Can, I mean, I, can I ask the dumb question and just say, why? Yeah, so, you know, it's thought that um, there's a number of factors that go into why certain people get colorectal cancer and why it's so common. You know, some of the common risk factors are family history, so genetics. If you do have a family history of colorectal cancer, it does increase your risk. But then there are a lot of lifestyle factors as well that have been shown to increase your risk. So, for example, smoking, obesity is a big one. But then also eating uh, certain foods, such as red meats and processed foods. And so we know definitely the prevalence of processed foods in the American diet has increased dramatically over the years. And so I think that's a big reason also why we're seeing more and more younger people, especially getting uh, colorectal cancer, that along with obesity. Do you think it's a good idea if you uh, host a podcast about cancer awareness to bring in a giant platter of processed chicken for breakfast for your crew? Well, you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's hard because the... Uh, <laughs> Patrick is um, putting me down. Right no, now. this is all staying in. I, I, brought up, I brought in some unnamed little chicken minis. Um, just well, you so just we, named them. You just well, named I didn't them. name the restaurant, but um, I was just trying to be thoughtful because I knew the rest of the people here at Spot. I offered those to you guys and you both came in. You're like, no, we're good. <laughs> I saw that. And I was <laughs> like, what the hell? 
I love them, but damn it, was it a today. Quick drive. It was that or donuts because I was driving through. I dropped my kids off and I'm like, I'll bring you something nice. Now, I could have made some fresh fruit salad, but I was busy. I had five kids at my house last night. I'm just night. teasing. I'm going to eat one, one after things. this. Yeah, Sorry. no, and that's the exact reason why processed foods are, are so common now. Right? Everyone's busy. The yes. American yes. lifestyle has gotten busier and busier through the years. And so it, it's a lot easier to just pick up food from takeout or fast food or, or pick up something that's, you know, already prepared or frozen. Yeah. So this is why we're seeing a lot of younger people be, be diagnosed, a part of the reason, right? Lifestyle, lifestyle the processed foods that we're seeing. And um, I said this at the beginning, and, and we've said this a couple times throughout different podcasts. If you are 45 or older, go get a colonoscopy. It is really not that bad. I've had a couple and it is like what your sisters went through, life-saving. How did, how did your sister do with a stage three? Uh, I always forget to tell everybody she's um, alive and driving us all crazy today. Perfect. So, <laughs> yeah. so she's back to being the sister that drives you nuts. That's perfect. So I am shocked, even when you said those statistics, that it's the number three cause of cancer in the U.S. and the number two um, cause of death from cancer. We hear about, I hear about breast cancer all the time because I'm a woman and I'm in my 40s, right? I hear about lung cancer. But if I think about it, I really don't hear that much about colorectal cancer and what color the ribbon is or, you know, any of that. I don't hear about it. We're here to change that. Yeah. It's a blue ribbon, right? Right. March is colorectal cancer awareness month. And so when we talk about this, what are the biggest things we want people to know about colorectal cancer yeah, so I think the take-home messages are that colorectal cancer is preventable as long as you take the recommended screening tests, which you should start at age 45, both men and women. And the most common options are either a colonoscopy every 10 years or doing a take-home stool test. So you just have to choose one option, either a colonoscopy every 10 years or one of the stool tests every one to two, three years. And by doing that, you can not only detect cancer early while it's still curable. But if you choose the colonoscopy route, you can actually prevent yourself from getting cancer. Because with colonoscopy, what we're doing is we're putting a little camera in your colon and looking around and we can detect these little abnormal growths, which are precancerous growths. And when we see them, we can remove them and therefore prevent you from getting colon cancer. One of my best friends just did the test at home and it came back abnormal and she went in and they it was a polyp and they're they're going to, you know, it's it's all these things. But here's my question. A colonoscopy every 10 years seems like a long span. Is it a slow growing process? Yes. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, we do know that colorectal cancer is a very slow growing process. So it typically takes 10 years gotcha. for a little polyp to eventually grow and turn into a colon cancer or rectal cancer. So that's why we recommend the 10 year gotcha. guideline. And it, just to your point, about um, you know taking the time to do these tests. So many of us are just so busy every day, and and people feel like they're putting they want to put it off, and they don't have time for this right now. But what I try to tell people is, you know, it's a lot better to take that little bit of time now, you know, a day to do your colonoscopy or a few minutes to do the stool test, than to then end up with colon or rectal cancer, and that's going to take a lot more of your time. Guys, we all know too much sun exposure is bad news. You can get skin cancer, you can get a melanoma. It may not feel cool putting sunscreen on, but I'll tell you what's not cool, skin cancer. So put on some sunscreen, reapply it every 80 minutes. Every wear, 80 minutes. Every 80 minutes. Wear those cool UV shirts, you know? They're yeah. wide-brimmed hats. I love a good hat in the summer to protect my face. I never let my face get in the sun. I'm 46 and I don't have time for the wrinkles or the skin cancer. Yeah, I mean, go get a spray tan like Laura and then put the SPF on, you know? Uh, it's just not worth it, guys. So prevent skin cancer and uh, wear your sunscreen. And get your yearly skin cancer checks. It's important. I think it's important to note that I know the guidelines are 45 and up, but if you have a family history of colorectal cancer, your screenings can start earlier. So talk about the importance of knowing about that family history and how crucial it is. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So if you have a family history of colorectal cancer, and typically we, we care about first degree relatives, so that is a parent, brother or sister, or a child who has developed colorectal cancer, then you would be recommended to start screening at age 40 
or 10 years before your relative was diagnosed, whichever one comes earlier. So Terry, for your kiddos, that's 38, right? Yeah, but they've actually already had their colonoscopies, uh, a baseline colonoscopy. Right. So to Dr. Wang's point, I think it's not all general practitioners are even aware of some of these guidelines, and you have to advocate for yourself or for your family member. And I just think it's really important to be to be educated and to educate others along along these lines because it is the one cancer that is preventable, treatable, and beatable. Well, it's amazing because when you think about lung cancer or brain tumors or things, there's not you don't typically get to just go in and go get a scan on your lungs or on your brain. But this is this is similar to the to a mammogram. This is similar to a PSA test for prostate cancer. Like it is covered by insurance and it is a life saving. People think that if you go get a colonoscopy, the prep work is like you're just going to be miserable and cramping. And oh my gosh, it's really not that bad. It's a it's a small price to pay. I think I think we've we've run into this before when we talk about prevention and screening and stuff like that. And I, I think it's probably just the same hang up that most people have, which is. Regardless of how easy or uh, intense the screening may be, I think it just comes down to some people just don't want to engage in it because then you're flirting with making it real. As soon as you get screened, you're opening yourself and your mind up to the possibility of, well, maybe I do have cancer and I don't want that, therefore I won't test for it. And that kind of burying your head in the sand it really, I think, is just the main the main issue. Not not oh, does the does the dye f- make me feel weird? Does the drink taste bad? It's yeah. I've had a lot of patients who say, oh, they'd rather just not know. But you know what people don't realize is with colorectal cancer, especially if it's detected early, it's curable easily. You know by just getting a surgery. And you know to your point about the prep, yeah, the prep is not easy to do for some people. But again. Um, It's better going through that prep once every 10 years than to end up with a colorectal cancer that you're then going to have to undergo surgery or chemotherapy. Terry, did you have a family history before you? No. No. Mm -mm. So you wouldn't have even been getting known enough to be getting that that early screening because you didn't have parents or siblings that you knew of. I mean, your sister did end up having it, but you didn't know at the time. Correct. Right. So that was really just blindsided you. Yes, and so tell me more about what you do with Pedal the Cause and how you do so much work um, with supporting Sightman and what you're still doing today as far as your, your fitness goals. So Pedal the Cause is a bike ride here in St. Louis. It's held in the end of September. We raise money for cancer research. 100% of every dollar raised stays here in St. Louis and goes to Sightman Cancer Center for what we call seed money. So it's it's the money that it funds research that might not get started right away that is a little bit maybe potentially out of the box type things or it, it's it's the beginnings of research and then it gives those researchers down at Sightman uh, an opportunity to go out and apply for the the bigger funding from the NIH and the different larger mm-hmm. so we say that every dollar that we raise at Pedal the Cause brings in a return of investment of $7. So over the the course, we've raised over $35 million in about 13 years. This will be our 14th year for Pedal the Cause. And if you times that 35 million times seven, I don't even know what you get, a hundred and something million dollars that we've grassroots um, raised for, for cancer research. So it's it's an amazing, it's an easy way to give back. You don't have to ride a bike. You, you can sit um, in the spin zone. We have spin bikes. You can walk that day. You can volunteer. There's all kinds you of... sure you could sponsor a ride, a ri- person You riding. can donate. You can mm-hmm. sponsor a ride. I'm going to recruit while I'm here today. Yeah. Uh, and in my team, the name of my team is Powered by Hope. So hope is a very important word and in... And I wrangled Dr. Wang into riding on my team. And oh. now she has her kids that come and ride. Oh, and it's, nice. a, it's a celebration. It's an amazing, amazing event. Pedalthecause.org. What is What has, um, I always love to ask people, especially um, people that have, you had a really tough diagnosis. You, you, you know that it was a, when you heard the news, that was not 
that was not like, well, th- no problem. We'll just do this and this and beat it. So what have you taken? Well, from- my husband thought that. He no. thought we'll just beat <laughs> That's it. That's a man's view, I yeah. think. We just pull up our bootstraps Straps and, and move on. That's right. Yeah. But, but you, knew, you knew the reality of a stage four colorectal di- diagnosis that had metastasized. And you are now five years with no evidence of disease. And I would just, like, besides the hope and all that, how has this changed your perspective in life overall? Oh. Well, I always, I, I believe that your life is never the same as at nanosecond before you hear the words you have cancer. So, you know, I live every single day in the day. I'm not saying that I don't plan for the future and think about the future, but I live every single day in the day, and I try and do the best that I can for that day, and I try and do something for somebody else every single day. And I just I would say it's an, it's an attitude of gratitude, and I am so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for my medical team and for my family and for my friends and for my faith. I always say... Cancer has brought me so many blessings, and I live on a completely different plane than I used to live before. I am a totally different person. I had never, ever volunteered one hour of my life to anything prior to my cancer diagnosis. So it has been life-changing for me, and it has been absolutely, you know, in an odd way, probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me. I think we all know and have heard by now that smoking is not good for your health and it's one of the leading causes of lung cancer. But did you also know that it's linked to cancers of the head and neck, bladder, breast, kidney, and more? But if you do smoke, the good news is that within two years of quitting, the risk of those smoking-related diseases can begin to drop. And after 10 to 20 years, the risk of lung cancer and most other tobacco-related diseases nearly equals that of non-smokers. But listen, we know it's not always easy to quit. No, I used to smoke, and I can tell you from experience that once you stop smoking, you feel so much better. I mean, imagine a year or two down the road, you feel like a new man. If you need some help, luckily, the Smoking Cessation Program at Siteman Cancer Center offers a wide variety of resources. If you're interested in learning more, just click the Smoking Cessation Program link in this episode's description. Can I get you to say those statistics one more time before we wrap this up about about colorectal cancer and its prevention so we can really nail it home. Sure. So it's the number three most common cancer in the United States, and it's also the number two most common cause of death from cancer. And the most preventable cancer. Yes, and it's definitely one of the most preventable cancers that is out there right now. And, and I by just wanna... 2030, it's predicted to be the number one cancer killer from ages 25 to 50. It's just yeah. nuts. So we need everyone to walk away from this conversation, having conversations with their family about colorectal cancer history, talking to their doctors about getting a colonoscopy or something else by the time they're 45 and older, and letting other people in their lives know about that. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I also want to point out that early colorectal cancer doesn't cause any symptoms at all. So even if you're feeling well, you're not having any issues, it's still very important to get screened, even if you have no family history. I just every the more we talk about how preventative this is and the statistics, I just have this image in my head of Dr. Wang literally holding like like in one hand, here's a test that will tell me if you have this cancer, and in the other hand, the means to save you from this cancer. And people will just walk by and go, Nah, I'm I'm good. Right. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You might want to go back there, bud. Yeah. Take (laughs) take something out of each of her hands and um (laughs) And, and listen to what we're saying. Right. And it's really a shame because I see a lot of patients in my practice who don't come in until they're in their 60s, and they might have started to develop some symptoms like rectal bleeding or abdominal pain. And then we do the colonoscopy, and I find a colorectal cancer. And it's really a shame because I know that if they had come in earlier when we recommended them to come in, you know, now at age 45, that could have all been prevented. Yeah, and you mentioned these patients that are coming in at 60 or so, and they've never had a colonoscopy. What are the symptoms that are bringing them in, Dr. Wang? Yeah, so the most common symptoms for colorectal cancer include rectal bleeding that is, or blood in the stool. And, it, and this is probably the number one symptom that people see. But you know, the, a lot of people tend to dismiss this as, oh, it's just my hemorrhoids bleeding. But it's very important not to do that. Um, if you see any kind of blood in the stool or rectal bleeding, you need to get at least one colonoscopy to make sure that it's not something else other than hemorrhoids because it could be a colorectal cancer. 
Other than rectal bleeding, other common symptoms can include abdominal pain, unintentional weight loss, changes in your bowel movements, especially new onset of constipation since colon cancer can cause a blockage in your colon. Anemia or low blood count uh, when your doctor checks your blood work or fatigue. So those are the most common symptoms of colorectal cancer. So you mentioned asking in particular, Dr. Wing, a 60-year-old coming in. But I I just want to make sure this early onset is so important. And young people in their mid-20s are going to their doctors, describing many of the symptoms that Dr. Wang just said. And they're saying, well, you know, increase your fiber, do, you know, different things. And it is colon cancer, it's colorectal cancer that, that a lot of these young people have. And so it's just very important that we let people know that they need to advocate for themselves, like especially when you go see a general practitioner, because we, we still think that this can't happen to young people, and it can. So if it just doesn't seem right to you, you know, you, you have to just kind of push until you, you get the, the answers um, for yourself. Yeah. Is it, is it fair to say, I mean, this isn't, I'm not trying to knock general practitioners, but it sounds like the need for someone to advocate for themselves is probably due to a lack of like lights going off for general practitioners. Like if they're, if they're prescribing more fiber and stuff, is it fair to say that the light bulb isn't going off quick enough? Yeah, I think there's a misconception among general practitioners that young people don't get colorectal cancer. And I've personally treated a lot of patients who have had delayed diagnosis of their colorectal cancer because they did go to their doctor with these symptoms, with rectal bleeding, and it was just dismissed as hemorrhoids. And then, you know, more than a year later is when they finally show up, you know, in my office to get a colonoscopy. But which By is that tough. time, I, yeah. if, if I was 25 years old and I went to the doctor and I wasn't feeling good and they were like, take this and, and you'll be fine, I, I don't know that I would be pushing back much. Or if I was worried about it, I, I just feel like it's kind of daunting to be like, no, I want a colonoscopy family doctor that I've seen for 15 years. Family yeah. doctor that you've probably seen for a couple of years because you were a pediatrician before that. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but, but, yeah, it's important. You know, if you're having symptoms and you see your general doctor and they recommend an initial treatment, if that initial treatment doesn't work, yeah. make sure you go back and follow up and tell them, hey, you know, I tried this, but it didn't work. I'm still having the same problems. And then at that point, the doctor will probably order further sure. tests. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate you both coming on here today, and I really hope that we got some people to listen because this is truly life-saving information, truly in every way, shape, and form, right? And one of the most miraculous stories of survival of this cancer. Really amazing. I'm sure people tell you that all the time, right? In your TED Talk, your first vision that you had when you found out you had cancer was your daughter standing in front of a mirror and your two sisters telling her, your mom would say this if she were here. And I am so glad that you got to have that memory with her. I'll show you the picture. I can't wait to see it. And you've hit how many of your goals that you set? All of them. Well, except <laughs> for your son getting married, because you sure put a lot of pressure on your <laughs> oh son. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I want to survive this cancer. I wanted my daughter to get married. And my I did that. <laughs> she got married. And my son still isn't married. <laughs> Your son has got to just be like... Oh, he's so used to it now. (laughs) My mom just gave a TED Talk about how I'm not married. (laughs) Well, you don't need to set goals because you hit them. That's why they're getting boring to you. So, Kyle, if you're out there, we just want you to know that if you don't get married, you're going to break your mother's heart. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Dr. Wang and Terry, thank you so much for being here today. Remember, awareness and prevention can save you from colorectal cancer. So get it done. Thanks for listening to This Is Cancer, brought to you in partnership with Siteman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, national leaders in cancer. For more information on Siteman Cancer Center, go to siteman.wustl.edu and be sure to leave us a review and like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.